Um, oh, man. Peacefulness. It Your is brackets peacefulness. are busted. Well, mo- most everybody, most everybody's bra- brackets are just trash now. Trash. It's just, just, just put them in the wood chipper along with all the <laughs> creeps and bad people in the world. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, what a weekend. SEC is being challenged, man. The conference didn't win the national championship in football. Still got a couple of teams alive to try to do it in basketball. Uh, the race is on around the country to take down the SEC. It's coming. Uh, strange calls by officials. Strange. Uh, you, you, you pick the games, but you know what? Ultimately, it's up to the teams to be better than the Zebras. And they <laughs> failed to do it. They Big failed time. to do it. Uh, six out of eight. Done. Out. Done. Out. Just done. So whine all you want. But uh, Mr. Krabs, you know what he's going to do? He's going to get the world's smallest violin out, and it's over. Yeah, play, 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 play in my heart. My heart bleeds for you. Yep. Yeah, and it's just, and I, you know what? Get better. Play better non-conference games Be uh, before the season, and get ready because the way the officials call the games in the in the, in the NCAA tournament, it's always going to be different, and they're not, you know. You look, you, you play a team, you pick the team, it's all going to be different. There are 363 schools eligible to play. Look, got a great lineup. Mitch Davis, MitchDavisShow.com, Mr. Basketball, Mr. Sports, Kevin Skarbinski, the Birmingham lead, Scarbo knows. Tommy Kane, Wolfpack, NC State, little Ooh. ACC pride, 25% of the Sweet 16 is from the ACC. And Franz Beer, the Iron Duke, will come on as well. A lot to talk about. Smash the subscribe button in the right, bottom right-hand corner. Get a pen, paper, handy. Take a lot of notes because we're going to be doing a lot of talking. Let's go. Sidelines with Rob Brown. Talk sporty to me. All right, Mitch uh, and Brendan. Let's get let's get it over with. Um, SEC uh, six out of eight done. A and M made it to the second round per pound for pound. Buzz Williams is probably the best coach in the SEC. He doesn't have a lot to work with. It's like an artist who only has a few paints and colors to work with. But what he does, it's beautiful. Uh, I really like him. Uh, I think a lot of coaches get a lot of uh, credit. But I'm going to tell you something. The further they get away from their big accomplishments, the further they are in the rearview mirror, you know, come on. Fans show up. Fans pay for this stuff. Pa- fans support it. God Bless America. The teams and the coaches have got to show up. Mitch, you've watched a lot of basketball over the weekend. You were down at the FedEx Forum. Uh, a lot of teams came in. Uh, one of them's leaving. I know Houston is Houston's an outstanding team, and so is Clemson. I mean, they're, Clemson beats Baylor. Houston had to work for it. Your takeaways. Yeah, guys, it's good to see you all. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for having me on. I really appreciate it. Uh, I will warn y'all, if I do receive a phone call about uh, certain coaching stuff going on, I might have to jump off before my 8.30 time slot to take those phone calls. All right, Dan. It's uh, it's one of those mornings. uh, I'm fully expecting some news out of Kentucky, uh, out of Arkansas today, out of Vanderbilt today. So should be a busy day. Of course, we got the women's tournament going on. I did get to go up to the FedEx Forum and watch a lot of basketball. Uh, And really, truthfully, Rob, you were talking about Buzz Williams. I've spent a lot of time with Texas A&M over the last two weeks at the SEC tournament in Nashville. And then, of course, yeah. in Memphis as well, at practices and, uh, you know, various media stuff. And I 
have noticed the culture that he has built at Texas A&M is not built on winning. It's not built on losing. It's not any of that. It's built on having faith in each other and having having that faith to move mountains. You know, Buzz is a is a very very good man of faith, and he's a good guy. Uh, he's really fun to be around, and, and you know, it was such an <clears throat> honor and such a privilege for me to be a part of that and be a part of these Texas A&M uh, last two weekends. And you know, I'll take away a lot of a lot from that, and I know that now I have a friendship and Buzz Williams and his coaching staff, and, and it's a lot of. Uh, a lot of great things are happening down there in Aggie land. And I know we'll touch on a lot of other things, but uh, there are some, it's really funny because you start comparing that to other places in the SEC uh, that are going through some turmoil at like Kentucky and Vanderbilt. And the environments are just polar opposites right now. Yes. A&M yeah. lost last night, but the future of A&M and Aggie basketball is so bright and so exciting and under Buzz Williams, because people he he builds into people and he pours yeah. into people and you can tell that in his press conferences and how Wade Taylor and the other guys talk about Coach Williams. I know I, somebody asked, I think it was uh, one of the Tex Ags do. They asked him in the press conference the other night talking about the brotherhood and the love that they have for Buzz Williams and it was so evident. Uh, and the first thing they said, he goes, "Hey, he cares about us. He loves us. He loves us like he loves his own kids." Um, and, and you know they take pictures everywhere they go. It's all it's great environment i know we'll get get into this kentucky stuff because uh there is a lot of uh stuff going on i'm gonna meet my mic real quick because i'm getting a phone call but i'll, I'll just give me like two seconds all right well let, let's bring kevin skarbinski in here the birmingham lead and scarbo nose and birmingham u.s basketball writer hall of famer uh mitch i'm hearing you talk and uh and kevin jump in here right now mitch is saying he's looking for news coming possibly from kentucky vanderbilt arkansas busy day uh this is a great time of year, but there's a lot happening on a Monday morning. So uh, jump in this conversation, what you're hearing, and then we'll get it going. Well, first of all, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to be with you after a uh, eventful four days, the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament. Yeah. It always amazes me how quickly we go from, from 68 to 16. Everyone is so hopeful. You blink your eyes, and most of the teams are eliminated. Some were happy to be there. Some very disappointed in their ending, looking at you, Auburn, in particular. Yeah. And it's, it's why we love this event. It's often random. It's all, you can't script it. You can't predict it. At least I, I seem to have trouble predicting it. So yeah. it's – and the consequences are going to be start being felt – with the coaching carousel. Some guys will not be back. Some guys will leave of their own volition ahead of the posse. Others will be shown the door. Some already have. Look, you can say it's fair or unfair, but there are basically two basketball seasons. There's the regular season and then there's the postseason. And, and both yeah. matter. And yeah. anyone who says regular season basketball doesn't matter, isn't paying attention, it should matter. It's harder to win a conference championship over two and a half months than it is over four days or five days if you're NC State. But the postseason matters too. That's where the championships, other championships, the ones that people tend to remember more, that's where they're won. That's where the memories are made. Uh, you know, Auburn going to the Final Four in 2019, the only team still in this state's history to do that, which is a little surprising when you know the his basketball history of Alabama. But, yeah. you know, Obviously, Kentucky is the biggest domino out there if they were to make a change. And and I think, Mitch, you said Mitch mentioned it earlier. Yeah, it seems like uh, – I don't know if anything's come out yet today, but it's something will happen. To, I, I'll be shocked if we don't know something today definitively about the future of John Calipari. Yeah. Mitch? Hey, so – sorry, guys. I, I don't <laughs> – I need to get better on saving my contact information. That was yeah. the Arkansas area code, but it was a spam call, and I'm waiting on uh, <laughs> news from Musselman. I'm like, oh, my God, this could be – Would you like uh, some vinyl siding, Mr. Mr. Davis? <laughs> I need to start saving it. I'm telling you all, these last you got couple to. weeks have, have been yeah. tiring. I'll be honest with you all. It's, you know, you're out there on the road, and you're out there covering these games, and you get – you know, your contact it's, – it, it's a lot, guys. And, and I'm looking forward to now that, uh, you know, the local stuff is done with. I'm kind of looking forward to – watch this stuff from home and kind of relax a little bit over the next couple of weeks. But 
Uh, as far as Kentucky goes, you know, Matt Jones did a Twitter space last night talking about it. Supposedly, Cal is in New Jersey right now. Um, I, I don't know why he's in New Jersey. He's been kind of avoiding uh, the conversation that he needs to have with Mitch Barnhart. Um, I, I don't know if that was a planned trip like he does uh, after the season or if it was a let me get away from here and let me kind of think about it. The Kentucky fan base is divided. I, I have never seen a such a toxic, uh, hate-filled environment than what Kentucky fans are going through right now. Some of the UK fans um, still love Cal Perry, still love the attitude, and some of the older school of the, you know, my dad's generation, uh, my grandfather, they're like, hey, enough is enough because, and you guys know this, Kentucky basketball has always been Kentucky basketball. It's always been a great brand, always winning championships, Final Fours, SEC tournaments, all these great things. But there has been a sense of entitlement um, from the Kentucky fan base since John Calipari took over because John Calipari brought in such a pompous northern New Jersey, New York attitude that has kind of transcended over to the UK fan base. And it is such a toxic fan base right now. It just is. I mean, Kentucky fans, I can't even tell you all the last time, you know, Anybody in my family that are all Kentucky fans on my dad's side had fun watching Kentucky basketball. It's been yeah. five, six, seven years when they could actually legitimately enjoy Kentucky basketball without the pressure of losing in the first round of the SEC tournament, without the pressure of getting bounced in the Friday round of the uh, NCAA tournament. So there's a lot of pressure. If they keep Cal, there's going to be an unbelievable amount of pressure on next year's Kentucky team that it's almost unfair to those guys. What we saw this year, the pressure was too much. I mean, you can only ask 18, 19-year-old, 20-year-old kids to do so much, and that's kind of where Kentucky is right now because you have such a divided fan base, and I think everybody who knows me, follows my brand, knows my level of annoyance with coaches like John Calperi, like your Bruce Pearls, that think they're bigger than the game. Um, the game itself is bigger than those coaches. I mean, I look at guys that I've covered, Chris Jans, Buzz Williams, uh, Kermit Davis, you know, cool story about Kermit when he was at Ole Miss. My dad was in the hospital for three months and basically on his deathbed. And Kermit Davis would text me at least twice a week on Monday and Friday to check on my dad. Uh, Chris Jans does, you know, Chris Jans has done the same kind of stuff. Um, you know, when my grandfather passed in December, I had a lot of coaches text me. Hey, Mitch, praying for you, love you. Um, take your time. Don't come back to our team until you're ready. So I, I hear that from certain coaches, and then I go into press conferences with John Cal Perry and Bruce Pearls of the world, and they don't even take questions from guys like me because we're not going to be the ones that kind of you know kiss their butt and tell them that they're the greatest thing in the world. We hold, them, we hold their feet to the fire because as journalists, that's what we're supposed to do. Um, and that's kind of where Kentucky's fan base is right now. I was on a Twitter space last night with uh, my guy Dylan Ballard uh, from Sea of Blue talking about the situation, talking about what's going on. And a lot of Kentucky fans hated what I had to say. They, I said, look, Kentucky needs a coach in there that is going to come in there. Yes, Kentucky basketball is the, one of the premier programs, but need to realize that – sorry about that, guys. But need to realize that uh, – That's Kentucky fans. <laughs> that's that's Cal Barry. <laughs> <laughs> That's my dog. So they, they need to, you know, the next Kentucky coach needs to realize that come in there, coach basketball, and kind of be like a Tubby Smith of that program and kind of weather the storm a little bit because this fan base has gotten to a point where, you know, it is dividing families, it is dividing uh, friends. It, it is such a toxic, unenjoyable experience right now to be a Kentucky fan. Well, let Mitch, let me just, I think Kevin would agree. Spend a little time in Alabama with Auburn and Alabama fans. <laughs> uh, Come on down to Florida. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ke Come on Kevin, down, brother. Yeah. Hey, by the way, Mitch, let me say this. Kevin will tell you, but I'm, I put details about people. Like, I'll put Kevin Skarbinski, native Pottsville, Pennsylvania, lifelong Phillies <laughs> fan, Troy grad. I'm serious. Put that kind of stuff on their but Save every contact. I mean, it's just it's just good to know that. But Kevin, jump into this conversation, yeah. like along yeah. with what Mitch is saying. 
Yeah, first of all, first of all, Mitch, on, on that uh, on that arrogant northerner, New York, New Jersey remark. Uh, I resemble that remark, having grown, having grown up in Pennsylvania, graduated from high school there. Uh, but I, I hear what you're saying. Hey, I'll put some numbers behind what Mitch just said, because this is the kind of thing I do in my spare time. You could divide John Calipari's tenure at Kentucky into the years up to 2015, when he had the undefeated team. Everyone expected him to win the national championship, which would have been his second in four years. They lose to Wisconsin. They're 38 no, they lose to Wisconsin in the final four. Since then, okay, so in those one, two, three, four, five, they made five NCAA tournament appearances his first six years. They had one NIT. In those years, he went 32 and 11 in the NCAA tournament, four final fours, one national championship. In all the years since, one, two, three, four, seven NCAA tournament appearances, and again, one wiped out by COVID for everyone. And they would they were very good that year. Uh, and then another year when they did not make the NCAA tournament, 2021, they went to the NIT. In those seven NCAA tournaments, he's 10 and 7. Mm. 10 and 7. Went from 22 and 4, 32 and 11. I'm sorry, went from, he was 22 and 4. Can't read my own writing. 22 and 4, those first five appearances, 10 and 7 in the seven appearances since. With no final fours. And meanwhile, he's been passed, and Kentucky has been passed by, let's see, Alabama, Auburn, Tennessee, in the postseason by Eric Musselman in Kentucky, who have two Elite Eights and one Sweet 16 in the last five years. So it's only natural. Kentucky fans should expect and want and demand more, and so should the university. Kevin, uh, Mitch, let me tell you something. Everybody watching this show. Sunday night Twitter X action with Kevin is unreal. Mitch, follow Kevin, y'all. Back, he's putting out information last night. Hey, no, uh, I for one don't pull for other schools to lose. I don't get happy with that. That's just not my style. I've got friends from all these fan bases. It's what's fun about doing this show. But Kevin pointed out last night. Nate Oates, say what you want about him. Third Sweet 16 in the last four years. Arkansas has been to two in the last three or four years. A couple of Elite Eights, okay? Uh, Give credit where it's due. And as far as Kevin, look, Pennsylvania is a lot like Alabama. When you get, you know, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh in between, that is Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, uh, and then you came to high school in Troy down in the Wiregrass. So uh, I think of a Yankee, I think of someone from, you know, New York, say more up in that area. But Kevin is, uh, Kevin spent more of his adult life in the South. Than he did Kevin's one of us. Kevin, He's, you're Kevin, one of Kevin's us. Kevin's one of us. But even if he <laughs> wasn't, we still love him because you know why? He's a, almost a daily celebrant at Mass. That's what I love about him. But Kevin, yeah. jump back in here, Mitch. And you know the difference, Kevin, between you and Coach Cal and Coach Rick Pitino and them? You're not wearing four or five piece suits and Armani's and the, <laughs> you know, Versace's of the world. It, you know, I'm lucky I can pronounce Armani and Versace. <laughs> I certainly can't I'm afford that, that kind of flag. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it's just crazy because, like, that stuff works in the Big East. That stuff might work in the ACC. But Kentucky, man, they're an agriculture state. They are a – Blue collar, bring your bring your lunch pail to work type of uh, you know state, just like the rest of the SEC is, except Mizzou. Mizzou's a weird place, but that's what Kentucky needs. They need somebody to come in there, bring that lunch pail to work, and play blue collar basketball. Get back to the basic, get back to playing defense, getting back to playing physical basketball. Because I, when I watched from Kentucky, I think it was on Thursday night. Uh, my days are starting to run together now, guys, but. On Thursday night, that Kentucky game, Kentucky was scared. They were timid. They were had all the weight on the world on them. When I watched Alabama last night, Alabama, man, and A&M as well. A&M should have won that game had they hit free throws. But those two teams, they came in there, played physical, they played their brand of basketball, and had opportunities to win. Kentucky, this is such a weird place to be because I, I've seen also some names tossed around if they do get rid of John Cal Perry, Jay Wright, Billy Donovan, Brad Stevens, like those guys are great names. One, Jay Wright's not leaving TV. Like he's he's, he's got it made. Why would he come back to college to coach and NIL and all this crap? Why would he do that? 
And then you got Billy Donovan and Brad Stevens. Brad Stevens is sitting in a front office in Boston, Massachusetts, making an ungodly amount of money, not having to recruit, not having really to do much other than just watch basketball and, you know, draft a player here, you know, Jason Tatum here and there. That's what Brad Stevens, I don't know about Billy Donovan. I don't know if Billy Donovan would come back. But like I said, Kentucky needs somebody. I got blasted on the Twitter space last night for saying this, but they need a Chris Jans, Buzz Williams, somebody like that to come in there, kind of get a new identity for this fan base and get a new identity for this program. Because that, that to me, when I think of Kentucky basketball and I think of growing up with my dad and going to the SEC tournaments and watching Tubby Smith and what, and hearing the stories about Joby Hall and Coach Rupp, when I think of Kentucky basketball, I think of that blue collar mentality. I think of, you know, making it fun for everybody. And, and it's just so, it, it's crazy to me to see this divide. You know, Kentucky basketball is not having all these rappers come in and, you know, be the faces of Big Blue Madness. It's not having, you know, Barack Obama wear a UK basketball jersey, you know, here. It's not that. Kentucky basketball is about playing for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And that I think that that has been lost uh, right now in the shuffle uh, with the situation with Coach Cal. Great point. Kevin, were you, weren't you the one – I always give credit where it's due. Isn't that what sick means in parentheses when you write nowadays? But, Kevin, you pointed it out last week. Since 1998, UConn has won five national championships. I think Duke's won three since then. Uh, Kansas has won a couple. North Carolina's won a couple. Uh, Kentucky has won one since then. I mean, UConn owns college basketball. They are the power in college basketball. And I think credit needs to be given where it's due. You know, Kevin, I mean, nothing against uh, – I mean, I want the SEC – but, by the way, Kentucky's a liquor state too, by the way. The bourbon yeah. trail. So, hey. anyway. <laughs> well, and that's – you know, Danny Hurley is a perfect example of a blue-collar yeah. guy. Nate God, Oates yeah. is a blue-collar guy. I mean, that's his slogan, blue-collar basketball. They give out a hard hat yeah. at the end of every game to the player who accumulates. And they and they stat this, they chart this, you know, the hustle stats, taking charges, getting deflections, uh, things like that. And they certainly, those numbers had to be high last night because that was not a pretty basketball game in the least. But if you think Alabama is only about making threes, playing fast, then you're not you've not been paying attention because yeah. they won that game last night as much on will as they did skill. And it was interesting. You know, it seemed like the entire the entire Grand Canyon student section well, <clears throat> student population was in the arena in Spokane. Yes. Last night. And I don't <laughs> know if you guys noticed it. They wow. must have mic'd, I said this on Twitter, they must have mic'd up a preteen daughter of one of the coaches or sister of one of the, of the players because every time something went well for Grand Canyon, you heard this piercing scream like you yes. might hear at a Taylor Swift concert. So, not that I've ever been to a Taylor Swift concert, but uh, I imagine. You're a hey, they're fun, you know, Kevin. I, I've, I've been with my wife. They're, Swifty. Don't, don't hate it. It's, it's, <laughs> It's not, no, it's not hate. No, you it's should hate it. I'm not operation. a Swifty. So. But it was clearly <laughs> a pro Grand Canyon crowd. Yes. And of course, and then the, the neutrals want the always want the underdog to win. Yes. So Alabama, and then Alabama falls down by three with six minutes left. They're in terrible foul trouble. They've lost, you know, one of their emotional leaders in Latrell Reitzel. And and prayers for that young man. Another head injury last night. Oh. That's what kept him out late in the regular season. We hope yeah. he's okay. First of all, just physically, forget about whether he can play Thursday or not, but obviously he's a key part of that team. So every a lot of things had gone wrong for Alabama at that point. Grand Canyon's on a run. The crowd is into it. And that's when Mark Sears steps up like yeah. an All-American yep. should. And that's when Mohamed Diobate, a true freshman who'd gotten very little run throughout the entire season, just – came into his own. He had the all nine of his points in the last five and a half minutes when Alabama just took control of that game when everything was going against them. That was a big win. I know you're supposed to be the 12 seed if you're a four seed, as Alabama was, but that was a very difficult game, and they showed me a lot by the way that they came back at the end and, and really pulled away. So that, But that's a blue-collar team, and, and that's the kind of guys, Danny Hurley and UConn. Hey, Auburn – 
you would never say you would rather lose in the first round, okay? Yeah. But I'm not sure Auburn wanted to see UConn in the Sweet 16 because that's who they would have played had Auburn advanced. And my goodness, UConn is doing uh, things that might be classified as felonies to everybody they face so far. <laughs> Let me throw something that that's a great take. Auburn, if uh, Chad Baker, Mazzara, and we all have ch- things that happen to us where we're mad enough to push somebody or to do something stupid. You, I love that kid. But the, the way they officiate, and Kevin, you know this, and Mitch, you know it, and so do you, Brendan. They officiate differently in these tournament games. And going 2,500 miles, I said this, I, I'm, I'm still – I'm mad at Hugh Freeze for still whining about having to go play at Cal instead of saying, what an opportunity to take the brand across the country. And hell yeah, I don't care. Coach Dye used to say, I don't give a damn if you got to play in the parking lot. We're going to be ready. That's the mentality that you got to have. I wake up Monday mornings, my favorite day of the week, especially when I got Mitch and Kevin on here, and Tommy Kane, Wolfpack. Boy, that's going to be fun. By the way, I'm driving in my truck yesterday morning out doing some run stuff. And I'm listening to Survive in Advance on ESPN on satellite radio. Jim Valvano, na 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 na. na. <laughs> oh my God! Did that you, you you gotta listen to it. It's 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 just I love this time of year. But Chad Baker Mazzara, you know what do you say? I just you gotta. It's like in football, the last one to push gets the penalty. Without him, Auburn's a different team. But still, with all that being said. You got to hit your free throws. You miss five of the last seven. Kevin, you get six turnovers in the last few minutes. Still could have won that game. Kind of your takeaway from that game and what is Auburn, you know, everybody other than uh, the Bermanator, Lior Berman from Mountain Brook, who's going to be, uh, I believe, a future coach. I, lo- I love that kid. It's one of Bucky McMillan's kids. Um, and the other one that I'm a big fan of, that I, I think is fantastic, um, Jalen Williams. He's done. The winningest player in Auburn history. But your takeaway from that Auburn-Yale game? Well, obviously wildly disappointing. Uh, for that performance from almost from start to finish, although they did start strong. And look, we all know that CBM, as they call him, who went ICBM uh, in that moment, <laughs> which cost his team yeah. dearly. And you can argue whether it should have been a flagrant one or a flagrant two, but there was no question it was intentional. It was unnecessary. And it did cost his team. Now, he's a valuable piece for Auburn, no doubt. He is not an All-American. He is not scoring 20 points a game. He is not the the go-to guy every time when the chips are down, like, say, Mark Sears at Alabama. So... For a team that we have all touted as maybe the deepest team in the country, because they have been, they've gotten contributions up and down the roster, one through 10, one through 11, when Lior Berman was healthy, yeah. to, to say, as Bruce Pearl did afterwards, that that so disrupted that, and that's the word he used, disrupted. It did disrupt them, but come on. Yeah. You've got to be able to overcome that. You You're do. Playing you Yale, do. All right. And look, yes. And Yale's guard, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, when had a career game, he's making he, – he, that that step back, fall away, baseline jumper over 6'11", Dylan Cardwell, was a thing of beauty late in yeah. the game. Kevin, Kevin, real quick, let me say something. Mitch, you got to go. Let, let people know. Look, love having you on here. Let them know how they can follow you. You do some great work. And then, Kevin, I apologize. I want you to continue. Yeah, guys, Mitch Davis underscore eight on Twitter, MitchDavisShow.com, and the podcast is on – Apple and SoundCloud and all that. Uh, Rob, next time I come back on here, I do want to talk to you about uh, my vision for the NCAA term. I know Craig Sankey wants to wrongfully expand it, but I have uh, I have reasons to uh, or ways that we can fix it, making this tournament go back to more geographical, making it make sense where the Midwest teams play in the Midwest, South, etc. So we'll talk about that. I have a really cool breakdown. Uh, I, I don't know who I texted it to, but I can go back and look at my notes and okay. actually broke down, even go as far as breaking down mid-major conferences that would feed into the South Regional or feed into the Midwest Regional, where winning the Midwest or winning the South Regional, winning the West Regional would actually mean something because that means you would be the best team in the South. Obviously, you would have weird situations where a team would have to go play somewhere else. 
but we'll talk about that next time I'm on. I, uh, I spent a lot of time on Saturday while I was kind of watching basketball, kind of typing yeah. out some notes. I was going, okay, I love Craig Sankey as a person, but I strongly disagree with a lot of things he's done the last two years with college athletics, not just basketball, but football as well with expansion. And yeah, I just don't like what he's doing right now, but that's okay. Yeah. So, but guys, I really do appreciate y'all having me on. Kevin, good to see you. Brendan, Rob, I will holler at y'all, I guess, next week. So I appreciate y'all having me on. Love it. Have a great day, Super Banker. We'll talk to you. <laughs> Thanks, um, guys. Kevin, Kevin, you were making great points. Pick up. Okay. So, and I like Mitch's thought about uh, Greg Sankey. Uh, yeah. Someone needs to, someone really needs to have a heart to heart with Greg on, yeah. on that, specifically on the subject of the NCAA tournament. All right, back to Auburn. You are a deep team. You have won 27 games. You just won the SEC tournament. And no, you did not play Tennessee or Alabama or Kentucky. But you ran through three teams that made the NCAA tournament pretty convincingly. So you should be going in on a high. And it really kind of started, and you mentioned it, Rob, it kind of started on the wrong foot with Bruce Pearl and Stephen Pearl yeah. talking about going to Spokane. Now, that's one thing for, for fans or for me as a writer to say, man, I can't believe they sent not just Auburn. They sent <laughs> all four teams from Alabama that made the <coughs> tournament. They yeah. sent UAB, Alabama, and Auburn all to Spokane, and they sent Sanford to Salt Lake City, Yeah, which, again, is a hardship for the fans. And it's okay to mention that, but they seem to harp on that a little too much. They seem to be a Correct. little too, too emotional, and they emphasize that far too much, I thought, early. But still, you got to play. Wherever you play, you got to play. <laughs> That's right. No, 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 Mr. Wolf. No, 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 go. It's Mr. Wolf. Mr. Someone's Wolf. very happy today. <laughs> Hell We're yeah. happy for you, Tommy. Happy for you. <laughs> Love it. Kevin, keep rolling. This is great. So, uh, nice to nice to introduce uh, uh, some good feeling as we're talking about Auburn, yes. which should not have a good feeling about itself. Yeah. Today and going forward, there's no excuse for the way they played down the stretch. They look yeah. tight. They look nervous. Yeah. Well, what they looked like was a team that won 26 of its 27 victories by double digits. That didn't have yep. to cut out victories. That didn't yep. have to go to the line with the season on the line. And, and they just didn't step up. You know, the ridiculous turnover by KD Johnson going 100 miles an hour when 50 would have been fine at that point. You had no numbers advantage. You had no fast break there. He just loses the ball crossing half court. You know, critical mistakes like that. And then even, even after all of that, on the last possession, how many chances did they have? to either tie or win the game. So really no excuse. And it looks worse because nothing in this state that happens at Auburn doesn't also include what it means or in relation to Alabama and vice versa. So while Auburn has been, look, you can't argue with the numbers over the last five, over the last set, seven, eight years. But since Nate Oates got to Alabama, and this is the subject of my column today, you know, Nate Oates was hired in March of 2019, the day before Auburn played North Carolina in the wow. Sweet 16. Yeah. Auburn beats North Carolina. Two days later, they beat Kentucky. They go to the Final Four. They shatter that glass ceiling for the state. But <laughs> since then, while Auburn has been arguably the second best program in the SEC, guess who's been number one? It's been Alabama. Yeah, yeah. And there's no question. Nate Oates has the most wins of any coach in the league in the last five years. He now has three Sweet 16s. He's got the most SEC championships with four, two in the tournament, two in the regular season. By any measure, Alabama's been the best basketball team in the SEC at one of its most competitive stages in history while Nate Oates has been there. And that has knocked Auburn down a peg because Auburn just has not performed at the level that they've achieved in the regular season in March. Correct. It's a fact, <clears throat> like it or not. And so... Bruce Pearl and company, they've got to step it up because, look, again, the regular season is not meaningless. It matters to win an SEC championship. It matters to go 13-5 in that league and finish in a four-way tie for second place, one game behind Tennessee, as Auburn did this year. 
but you also have to do it in March. And let's be honest, yeah. since the Final Four, with the exception of this last SEC tournament, Auburn hasn't gotten it done in March. Yeah, and I agree year. with you. I agree with you totally. You got to tell it like it is. And coaches, quit your God bless America. Quit whining about where you got to play the damn games. Fans, yeah, fans can do it all day long. Coaches, you sit there and you go, look, I'm just glad we're in this tournament. We're ready to go. We'll play on the moon if we have to. All right. Na, 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 na. I watched Coach, and listen to survive in advance. <laughs> Driving around yesterday morning, had to run some errands. Went for a six and a half mile run. I'm driving back and I'm listening to that thing going, man, after a run and all those endorphins clicking, and then you hear that. Holy shnikes. Tommy, you win five straight. This guy Burns, by the way, Kevin, is an icon. He's a cult figure, man. Where is he from? What do you know about him? But y'all are in the Sweet 16, and ACC has four of the 16 teams. So the ACC is going away, huh? Not so – not likely. It ain't happening. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, what a great run for the for the ACC. I mean, Clemson looked great. Great, did they? They were clicking on all cylinders. The whole game, they were. I think Clemson started to, to uh, have a lull there near the end. That they just stepped up and kept playing. Uh, had in Tommy, nice, Tommy, really nice can victory. can you reboot real? Can you reboot real quick and uh, try to come back in? Yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah. Re reboot and come back in. We're we're only hearing every other word, so we'll bring you right back in. Uh, you know what he's saying, and 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 at this point, you know, Kevin, look, I don't care if you're a fan or not. The coaches have got to be above that. And granted, you got ten guys on that team. You got forty minutes to get the game won. And and I just, I just, I don't like the. I don't want to hear excuses. You either get the job done or it's on you. And the coach, it, it, it's, it is frustrating because Nate Oates, I, I saw a lot of people on social media last night bashing, saying this and that. I mean, look, man, get your own house in order before you go bashing another school. It doesn't matter whether they beat a, a 7 and a 12 or a whatever seed. They're, they're in the Sweet 16 and you're not. Tommy, let's try it again. Can you hear me better now? Perfect, perfect. All right, yeah. good deal. <clears throat> I was just waxing poetic about my Wolfpack, so you didn't miss much. <clears throat> um, I mean, what a great run for the Wolfpack all the way through the ACC and now doing what they're doing. But for the ACC in general, um, you know, like I was saying, Clemson played a great game yesterday against Baylor. I really didn't think they would hang with Baylor. I thought Baylor would maybe have better athletes. But Clemson just played a great game. They let them get back in it a little bit near the end, but they held on. And so having four teams in the final 16 is – Really good for the conference. Um, you know, Duke, I think, surprised a lot of people how well they handled everybody yesterday. And so uh, it's it's a great time of the year. I mean, even it makes it so much more fun when your team is still alive, obviously. But oh, yeah. Even, even when it's not, it's just like – it's just good basketball. Like, while watching that game last night and that kid hit the, the three-pointer at the buzzer to tie and put in overtime. Yeah. For, uh, <laughs> was it – I mean, yeah. It was just, A&M, it was, yeah. A and M. It was just great basketball, and and uh, and taking Houston to the to the thing there. I did. I will tell you this. You know, I did have a nice little parlay going yesterday afternoon, and all I had to have was Houston <laughs> win by eight, and Texas <laughs> Texas A and M's came creeping back. They went by thirteen with like a minute to go, and I was feeling good about it. And I was going to be paying paying my mortgage for the next month with my little parlay. And yeah. then, of course, basketball happened, and that's and that's how it works. But uh, yeah, but. It made what a great time of the year. It's just so much fun, and I'm really, really uh, proud of my Wolf Pack. I mean, like you, like you said, that DJ Burns kid is. Um, I mean, we've seen it all last year and this year. He's just a he's a beast. He's a four, he's, he's got he's got the strength of an elephant down there banging on people, and he's got the feet of a, of a butterfly and, and a ballerina. I mean, he's got great footwork. He's got a super nice soft touch, um, and he's smart. He's got a great basketball IQ, which I don't think people give him enough credit for. But he, yeah. He reads the double teams well. He gets rid of the ball. He's a great passer out of the post. He sees the court really well. And uh, I think, you know, the only knock on him is just his defensive ability because he's just not the, he's not the you know, the best defense defender as far as being able to get to the right place at the right time quickly because he's a little slow with that. But I tell you what, he's got his, it's beautiful to see a post player 
actually play the post again. You just don't yeah. see that <laughs> much more. You got your centers running down on the wing, pulling up for three pointers. You got, I mean, look at the NBA. That's all. I mean, when's the last time you saw a post player dominating the NBA? It just doesn't happen yeah. anymore. They're all, no. they're all just shooting threes and running up and down the court like gazelles, but it's fun to watch him bang in the post. It really is. It is. Look, I like this comment by Shoney down at Valdosta, Georgia. Best Clemson showing since Stan, Rome, and Tree Rollins. Tree Rollins. Franz Beard, it's the uh, Hurry Up, No Huddle uh, edition of Sidelines Monday morning show. So, uh, Franz and I talked yesterday when I was out hiking. Unbelievable conversation. Sundays with Franz. I mean, it's unbelievable talking about basketball. But, God, I love this stuff. Franz, jump into this melee. I love it. Well, uh, Tate's Lock got, got Stan Rome, Tree Rollins, uh, and, and and the best one of the three best college guards I've ever seen as a freshman, a kid named Skipper Wise, was on that team. Uh, left after a year, was a heroin addict. He ended up dying like about two years later, uh, at age twenty three. But Tate's Lock uh, broke every rule in the book. You know, now it's legal. Uh, <laughs> to, to put together that that Clemson team, and uh, it, it 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 was pretty you know, what a, what an amazing ball club they had, and and if Tate's had, had been able to stay within the rules because the NCAA was kind of on the war path in those days, uh, Clemson yeah. basketball might have been really successful for decades to come but that you know that we're talking 1973 and i'm old and you guys are not so i remember i saw them play <laughs> well I, I i love friends what you're saying kevin on top of let's let's keep i love this rapid round fire thing but what he's just saying the history the traditions the heroes I don't mind. Look, I'm I I have my school where I'm a graduate, but I get excited watching other fans be excited. And when you do a show and you got we all know people fans of other schools, you kind of I hate to say it, you can live vicariously through them and still love your own school. You're not being disloyal, are you? Uh, no, no, not, not at, at all. all. I, and I, I'll tell you what, it was fun last night watching the Aggies in Houston, watching Jim Nance. There, yeah. you know, he's not calling the ball games anymore, but he's there in his Houston sweatshirt, and yeah. he's literally living and dying with every with every turn of events. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Um, and, and I got to tell you something else: Buzz Williams can coach. Yes. Maybe just as far you know, when it comes to just being able to coach a team and get his talent. Now he may not be able to recruit the kind of guys that. You know, he, he can't recruit with Nate Oates. I mean, I don't know what's going on at Alabama, but they got great kids coming to Alabama and, and playing basketball. And that's never happened before. But, you know, it's, stuff happens. But Pro, Buzz yeah, doesn't like, have the talent. But, gosh, he it, whatever talent you got, he will squeeze it all out of you. And, yeah. and what, a, what a finish. And there's Anderson Garcia, who – I remember at Hamilton Heights Christian Academy out of uh, out of Chattanooga, literally begging people to please come see him play. I, I mean, the kid was, uh, you know, he was, <clears throat> he's just about one of these gifted rebounders. And I remember him saying, you know, please put my name out there. Nobody's recruiting me. He ended up being an afterthought at Mississippi State. Left Mississippi State and Buzz took a chance on him, and look what happened last night. Last night he became an Aggie hero forever. Yeah, and 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 Kevin, along these lines, there's just a lot of guys right now that what do we talk about on this show in the tournament? You play a lot of teams that have been together three or four years. Calipari said it, he admitted it. He said maybe the model is broken. We're playing against a bunch of 23, 24 year olds. Our average kid's about 19. Expand on that. I like that. Well, that's, that's the a truth. choice. That's yeah. a choice. Exactly. Well, that, that's his yeah. choice. And and it didn't just start this year. You know, the value of experience, the value of guys who have played against top-notch competition. And that's why we're learning about, you know, that's the great thing about, the, one of the great things about the tournament is we learn about guys that we don't know from like Gol Mr. Golke, the future tax attorney from from yeah. Oakland, yeah. who sets the you know, 
who comes up one short of the NCAA record with 10, 10 threes in the first game, first round yeah. to beat Kentucky. And then yeah. hits what? Five more in the second round. So he, he set a record. <laughs> in the rounds. I never heard of that guy, but he can play. There are a lot of guys that can play. Look at Alabama's roster. Mark Sears was not thought of as a top flight recruit coming out of Muscle Shoals, Alabama. God. So he goes to Ohio University for a couple of years. He proves himself. He comes back to Alabama, and all he's done now, he has scored more points this season than all but one player in Alabama history, and he's closing in on Reggie Mule King, who, who has the record. I mean, that's amazing. You know, Astra, Aaron Estrada is a transfer from a, from a lower-level school. You know, you can go down the roster. Those guys, they play fearless. They love their opportunity mm -hmm. to play against and with the best competition exactly. in the country. And they're, they're showing what they can do. And I got to say, friends, though, don't ever, don't ever around Wimp Sanderson say, this has never happened. Gathering this kind of talent has never happened at Alabama before because he will hit you with T.R. Dunn <laughs> and Leon Douglas. And, oh, I was and there. Can, I remember. We can, even come, we can even come more recently. Hollywood Robinson. Latrell Sprewell, Robert Ory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Colin Sexton. They've had great players there through the years. But Nate Oates is recruiting at a level beyond anything Alabama's even done, and that's pretty impressive because Alabama has brought in a lot of great players. They you know, have. I, I, I remember I saw Teddy Roosevelt Dunn play, you know, uh, what and, and what an absolutely wonderful kid. I mean, really, really was. C.M. Newton – did something that nobody else ever did in the SEC at the time. And that was he broke the rule that you could not put five black kids on the floor at a time. And I'll never forget, I'm, I'm at, a, I'm at a, a, a high school tournament and I am hearing a coach from, uh, an assistant coach from an SEC school talking to an SEC school, another assistant from an SEC school, and an assistant from an ACC school. And they said, you can't win in the SEC with five black kids. Three at the <laughs> most, three at the most, can't do it. Well, CM goes out there and put five black kids on the, on the floor at the same time. And I'll never forget, he won a game, I think it was like 48 to 46 was the final score. I'm trying to remember who they were playing. And people, and people were amazed, they said, well, if you put five black kids on the floor at the same time, the score will be 130 to 100. You know, they'll try to score 130 points. They'll never play defense. CM put them out there, and they played marvelous defense. CM, I, I, CM Newton is probably, when it comes to basketball in the SEC, probably the most pivotal figure of all time because we went from Adolph Rupp, who had a Confederate flag, hanging on the wall behind his desk uh, a, a guy who, a guy who who reluctantly had his first black player and we go from that to cm newton who was a Kentucky guy who played for adolph rupp i mean and coached for adolph rupp who came in yeah. there and broke that color what what a you know we have basketball in this league now now, everybody can talk about Rupp all they want to, but C.M. Newton is the most pivotal figure in SEC basketball history. I, I would agree with that. And, and Tommy, along those lines, I, I watch ACC Network a lot. And you were with Fox Sports Southeast, I think, for 15 years, ACC Network for eight years. They're really – you need to – and folks, and, and I know Kevin probably does and Franz, you better be paying attention to everybody else. You know, not just be myopically focused on your league, but damn – Four teams in the Sweet 16. Clemson gets that win over Baylor, and uh, somebody didn't send the memo to Homer Drew, the father of Bryce, and, uh, you know, J.D. Drew. <laughs> Stay awake at the games. You look like my dad, who's a confessed narcoleptic. But uh, talk about this resurgence of the league and watching Roy Williams in the stands. I mean, he's just Joe Six back up. I don't know who he's with, but, God, man, this is – I, I don't know. I, hearing Franz talk and Kevin and you, it's it's like going to a, a concert and they bring out the legends. Y'all know so much about basketball. 
Well, get Mr. Wolf up there again for us, Tommy. We got to see him. <laughs> I love it. I, lo- <laughs> I love Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf, I love it. <laughs> but yeah. Oh! <laughs> Let's talk about, though, how, how important after what the ACC has been going through with Jim yeah. Phillips and all this, this has got to be a rallying point for this league. It's not football, it's basketball, but the whole spotlight of the world right now is is on, yeah. you know, that league more than anybody else. Well, here's what I'll say, too, about that we were talking – you guys were talking earlier about just the, the tournament in general. Look, college sports right now, in my opinion, has a little bit of a black eye, right? There's, there's all the transfer portal. There's the NIL. There's the there's – there's the, it's just becoming – I don't know. It's just kind of like you're you're still following your team, but we've talked about this before, but like you don't really know who the players are when they're coming in and out and going. It's just all up and down. And then college sports, as we all grew up, loving it as a true amateur student athlete is obviously no longer, right? It's just not. But when you have a tournament like this where the whole country gets involved, everybody's pulling for the, for the Cinderella teams. There's great storylines. I mean, it's the best reality TV there is. It's period. I mean, there's just nothing better. It really, it kind of, re, um, you know, kind of gives you that extra spark of like, okay, college sports is still great, right? I mean, this is a great, great um, tournament every year. I mean, it, 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 like they always say on the tagline, it always delivers. March Madness always delivers. Something's always going to come up where there's a great storyline is a great thing. But when you talk about the schools in the ACC, you know, we talked about this, I think, last week or when I was on with you guys. If for those of you that aren't from North Carolina, like myself, you got to understand NC State, Duke and Chapel Hill are 15 minutes from each other. Yep, 15 minutes. It's like driving from here to the other side of, of town, you know, just to go to the to go to go to Walmart. You can drive into Durham, North Carolina, or you can drive into Raleigh, or you can drive into Chapel Hill, maybe 20, 15 minutes tops, right? That's like, and then you have all three of those schools are still in the AC and in, in, in the Sweet 16 in and in a geographic little footprint like that. So just imagine what that's like from a rivalry standpoint, from a, a crap talking standpoint. I would use another word, but we're on radio. And, you know, but so there's, it's a, it's, it would, it's, it's no different than really having Auburn, Alabama, and let's say like Ole Miss all within 20 minutes of each other, right there in that little area. I mean, that's oh, what you're, wow. That, that's what you're dealing with. Um, yeah. So, and, and for the ACC, much like football is a religion in the SEC and it's live and die and people live and breathe. That's what <laughs> basketball is for the ACC, especially in North Carolina. Oh yeah. Around those schools. And then you throw in Wake Forest, who's a good program. It's right down the street in Winston-Salem. Yep. I mean, and there's no other place in the country that's got that kind of talented schools when it comes to basketball within a, you know, a 15, 20 minute radius of each other. It's just a unique situation. And to have all three of them still dancing, it's just awesome. Tommy, it we is. used to have this thing yeah. called the Big Four Tournament. In, that's right. Uh, in in, yeah. in uh, December. Wake Forest, Duke, Carolina, and, and NC State, yeah. And they put it, played at the Greensboro Coliseum, yeah. sold yep. out. You know, I remember – and this is in 1975 terms. People are selling t- our 74 terms. People are scalping tickets for three and four hundred dollars to get in for a two night event just with those yep. four. It, yep. it, it is it, it is the most unique situation in all of college sports for for a for one particular sport. It's not yeah. for football. But for basketball, there's nothing like it. I yeah, when when we were in Charlotte last month, and I was texting with my son who lives in Charlotte, he was playing golf in the Highlands Saturday. But he says, when you go to these games up there, and I know we're sidelines, SEC Sports Network and SECU, but you know what? We all got first cousins and in-laws. That's the ACC and the SEC. We're damn – we are so interconnected, okay? But God, he said, when you go to these games, his boss – uh you know, when he was doing uh, – going to games as a Carolina grad, he sent me a picture last year from the Dean Dome down there about six rows off the court. The and wine and cheese? Were, wine and cheese yeah. dome? I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But I you love think about, Carmichael. When, when we were in college, you know, people wore a coat and tie. At least you had to as a damn pledge. That was miserable in the drunk tank, 150 degrees at Jordan Hare. But, you know, people go to those games up there in the Carolinas I mean, they wear a sport coat, you know, nice blazer. It's a it's a really classy deal. Um, 
I think Auburn and NC State are very kindred spirits, okay? Uh, I, I I love Doran, your football coach. I mean, he does not like North Carolina, and he doesn't hold back, <laughs> and uh, neither does Mr. Wolf. But this, friends, you're so damn lucky to have seen stuff like that. But when you get into North Carolina and you turn at Hickory to go into Charlotte, and of course, Winston-Salem's not far. Greensboro is kind of – uh, the Hollywood Bowl of basketball in the ACC, Tommy, isn't it? It really is. It really is. I mean, in fact, I was just in Greensboro Coliseum on this past weekend. I took my young daughter to see the ACC Women's Gymnastics Championships. Yeah. She's a, she loves the gymnastics, and so we went up to see that, and it was the first time I'd ever seen a gymnastics event in live personal, and it was, it was mm-hmm. pretty cool. And NC State ended up yeah. winning the, the, the title there, but just there a good go. atmosphere. But Greensboro – I mean, right there is the Hall of Champions. I don't know if you guys have been to Greensboro in a while, but they built that onto the uh, side of the Greensboro Coliseum. It's the ACC wow. Hall of Champions. And it's a whole museum of just ACC greatness and stuff like that. And when you walk through the halls of Greensboro Coliseum, they have, you know, inlays in the wall of like trophy cases as you walk around the concourse of the Coliseum. And they'll have like the whole, they had to have a whole section of just the 74 game of between Maryland that was considered the greatest college basketball oh, yeah. game ever played. I mean, they have a whole section just for that. They have the ACC championship trophies. So Greensboro is the, you know, the mecca of ACC when it comes to what it used to be, right? It's a little different yeah. now when you got schools in there like Syracuse and Notre, in, uh, Notre Dame and, and Pittsburgh. I mean, they don't, have, they don't have any allegiance to Greensboro, could care less what that means. But for those of us that grew up in the area, Greensboro is the mecca for the ACC basketball. And Kevin, well, you've I, been I, to I that hallowed ground. ground. Yeah. Yeah. College, sport, college sports lost something when we went with all this expansion oh yeah uh, i gotta tell you what when we had the the sec was better when it was a 10 team league yeah the, the, i loved when we had the southwest conference i loved the eight team acc it, oh yeah, yeah it's all about the all about the money <laughs> but the benjamins you know, i i was in, in 70 74 when north carolina state won it at the maryland game 103 to 100 in overtime. Both teams shoot 60 percent, and the defense was God. phenomenal. Yeah, both there was not a single walking violation, charging foul, offensive foul, not a single three second call. The most perfectly played ball game you could imagine. And then three weeks later, North Carolina State plays UCLA in double overtime, coming down from 11 in the first overtime. Well, excuse me, 11 in regulation, 11 in the first overtime, and seven in the second to win it, and then plays Marquette. Yeah, I mean, Kevin, along the line of what they're saying, this is what fuels this interest. And, you know, you got NC State's going to play Marquette this week. The SEC – is the league getting close to where we're going to have something in Birmingham for that? Because those two guys understand it, and I, I'm sure you do. You're in the U.S. Basketball Writers Hall of Fame. But it is when you go into North Carolina during basketball season, college basketball season, and you just go up and down volume 10 on the radio and listen to all these great basketball games, Tobacco Road, uh it's magical. It's like driving from Huntsville to Orange Beach on a football Saturday in the South in the state of Alabama, isn't it? Well, look, the SEC has, has proven itself over time in basketball, but this is this is really important. Al- the way Alabama and Tennessee perform from here is really important because the league has not been to the Final Four since Auburn in 2019. Yeah. Has not won a national championship since Kentucky in 2012. And so they, they have not done done it in March when yeah. most people are watching. And, man, has karma ever smacked anyone around as much as it did Greg Sankey through the first two rounds of this tournament after what he said a couple of weeks ago to Pete Thamel of ESPN.com saying – you know, they've got to revisit these automatic qualifiers. You've got automatic qualifiers, meaning teams from the one bid leagues like Samford taking up spots that maybe should go to the, I don't know, the eighth or ninth or 10th place team in the SEC as they expand to 16 teams. Well, you know, six of your eight teams going out 
uh, by the first weekend is not oh, yeah. a good look. No. And <laughs> it is important that Alabama and Tennessee perform. They really need to get somebody to the Final Four. They need to get some. Somebody needs to win a national championship sometime soon. Or Greg Sankey, the, the piling on of Greg Sankey will continue. Uh, I'm not sure it will ever stop after what happened this past weekend. But yeah, this is important for the SEC because they've proven themselves as a basketball conference, but they're just not getting it done in March. And that's what most people are watching. That's what most people remember. Yeah, you, you, I agree with you. You are exactly right, Kevin. And, and the SEC, you know, Kentucky and Florida carried the torch for way too long uh, and without without a lot of help. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like what Tommy was saying about about what's going on in, in the ACC. Uh, I, I'm just tickled pink that you got North Carolina, North Carolina State, and as much as I dislike Duke, and goodness, <laughs> I mean, can, can can we all agree that nobody here nobody here likes Duke? We just don't. Duke's Duke's one of these places that that you know it's kind of like. Stepping on dog poop in your dog poop in your yard, you know, and you sit there and just scrape, you know, scrape it off, you know. But you still got to wear shoes. <laughs> I mean, it, Duke, yeah. Duke, Duke, Duke does that to you. But there's something about there. We got to have that. We got to have a breakthrough here. We've got to have Alabama's got to make a final four. They've never done it. Tennessee's got to make a final four. They've never done it. Yeah. Oh, you know, Mississippi State can't, has made a Final Four. You know, you, you look at the schools. that. How many schools that do you think we, in the league have made a Final Four? Mississippi State, I, you know, Auburn, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, Kentucky. Arkansas. Arkansas. LSU Arkansas. and Arkansas. LSU and Arkansas. But the, yeah. you know, half the league hasn't ever sniffed it. Yeah. You know, the only ones that have won a national championship are Arkansas, Kentucky. Florida, and Kentucky. Kentucky. Yeah. All right. Let me ask you something. They got a text here from one of our viewers, uh, Clarence Beeks, and he said, "Expand a little bit, one of y'all. Uh, I let you throw it at. You know, I'll, I'll throw it to uh, Tommy or, or Kevin, whoever wants to." what Greg Sankey said about taking away some of these bids from the smaller schools, giving them, I don't like that. I, I mean, and, and my dad, is, my dad listens so acutely to this show, by the way, it is Monday, March 25th, 2024, grand Bob, dad. Um, it's not Horatio Alger. It's Horatio Alger. That's what we love guys about college basketball, Kevin, Tommy, who have Tommy answer it. Yeah. Well, this is the only sport. <clears throat> I mean, you can't do it in football, right? You can't take the little guy yeah. and put Sanford football up against, like, Alabama and give him a chance in hell of winning. I mean, it's just not going to happen. But in no. basketball, you got five athletes versus five athletes on the court at any point yeah. in time. One guy gets hot, and all of a sudden you got a Cinderella, and you're upsetting. And it makes – like I said earlier, it's the best reality TV that there is out there because every game yeah. you're at your feet when there's an upset. I mean, Oakland beating Kentucky. How many people in this country picked Oakland in their bracket to beat Kentucky other than probably? I, I actually did. I put I, Audrey and I, my wife Mildred and I both picked Oakland because I, I used a contrarian logic. And I said, look at the age of those Oakland guys versus Kentucky. I, I used that system. Yeah. Well, here's what I'll well, tell Tommy, you. I'm glad, Tommy, I'm glad you mentioned Sanford because we got to <laughs> say a word about Bucky McMillan and the exactly. Bulldogs. They – were robbed of an opportunity yeah. oh, for God. an upset of a lifetime in that Kansas game. Bucky Ball emerged in the second half in all its glory. They wore down Kansas. They turned them over, and they made an unbelievable comeback. And the play of the tournament, and I will fight anyone who argues otherwise, mm -hmm. was A.J. Staten McCray for Sanford chasing down Timberlake mm -hmm for Kansas and coming up with a clean block with 14 seconds left. Sanford's down one point. Sanford gets the rebound. Should have had a five on four to win the game. And an official anticipates a call 
blows his whistle. Everyone saw it. It was not a foul. It was a clean yeah. block. And so Samford was robbed of, as I said, they would have had a 5 one and I And I, and I uh, talked with Bucky McMillan yesterday. And he said he absolutely would have played it out. He's not calling timeout. He's not holding for the last shot. He's got a five on four. They're going to go mm. down and they're going to get a good shot and yep. good chance they win the game the way they played in the last 10 minutes. So Sanford proved they could play with Kansas. And I know Kansas had had their best player hurt and Hunter Dickinson was, was big. He is big. He was big. Right. Uh, played not at 100%. But, hey, Sanford was right there to beat one of the most uh, prestigious programs in the history of the sport. That is the essence of of the NCAA tournament and anyone who wants to change that doesn't understand it and should have nothing to do with making decisions about what that tournament looks like going forward. That's exactly oh, right. Yeah. You know, you know, you, you brought up a point there. You look at, at some of the things Florida loses because right. If Bert Smith, who shouldn't be allowed to ride shotgun on a garbage truck, you know, <laughs> he sits there <laughs> three feet away, and he watches K.J. Uh, Simpson stick yeah. his hand out and forearm out and shove Zion pulling away, and he makes the game-winning shot. And Burt Smith sat there and swallowed his damn whistle. You could do, give him an MRI today, and you'd find that whistle lodged somewhere in his small intestines. I promise you. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we have seen – this is, but this is one of the things, as Kevin just pointed out, it makes this time of year so special because bad zebras get in this tournament just like, just like you know, and, and they affect games as well. You know, I, I gotta, I gotta admit, uh, you know, the, how many times have we seen an opportunity for an upset? Robbed, derailed by some zebra yeah. who I think is convinced that it's his it's his job to get one of the power conference teams moving up. And, and let me let me throw let me throw this one at you, Tommy. Listening to Survive in Advance, Jim Valvano and asked about how what strategy they would employ against Houston. We're going to hold the ball forever. When the game started, he goes, "Don't hold the ball." You know, I mean, right. think about. It. I, I, but Francis, right. the end of that Kansas Samford game. Also, I believe you're right. Don't mess with this tournament. It's special. Oh, Those gosh, who want no. to, you know, put them in the wood chipper. No, yeah, you can't mess with this tournament. I mean, it is. It, it, you can't. You, it's perfect to give the little guys a chance. They want to play yeah. on the national spotlight. The the Vermonts of the world want to play Duke. When's the last yeah. time Vermont got to play Duke on a national television stage? And all of a sudden, yeah. you have these guys that are like. You know, somebody comes out in the woodwork and he's a great player. I mean, yep. I mean, there's just there, there's just that's that's what it's all about. That's what makes this tournament so unique and so unlike anything else in sports, period, professional, amateur, whatever. This NCAA tournament is the best thing going. And if they mess with it, it's a travesty. Leave it as it is. Make it magical. Make it madness and leave it as it is. No question. Yeah. Uh, and Kevin, you, you know, you, you hear. Greg Sankey and, and other people that let's 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 take it away. And I, and I read Philip Marshall last week. Great writer, you know him, and I know him. Love the guy. Said if you expand the ninety six, okay, give the top thirty two a bye. Let those sixty four play, and then you, you go from there. If you're going to go in that direction, Kevin. Hey, if you want to expand the tournament, give an automatic bid to the regular season champions of these one bid leagues, and then yeah. if they have a different tournament conference tournament champion they get a bid also you want to expand yeah. the tournament put more samfords and oaklands and yales in i, well, I agree yeah. with you 100 percent. because not only that but that makes the like the acc regular season title like what is that like nobody can tell you who like every year who's the, the only the only title real title is the tournament champion is the title yeah. which happens to be my wolfpack by the way but yes, I'm just, but you know, like the regular season. Not that anybody I mean, knows, no. <laughs> I, mean, I like, love it. You couldn't tell, Franz. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Pop that hoodie, Tommy. Hey, I'm telling I you. I love what, it. Man, look, as a, as a state fan, I texted my buddies the other day. I was like, 
I'm always proud to wear the colors and be my NC State being my alma mater and having to be able to put, wear a jersey for a couple games there. But it's especially sweet now when they you walk around and people are like, hey, good game last night, pulling for you guys or whatever. It doesn't happen very often as an NC State fan. You know, we'll take it when we can get it. So, you know. Well. But think about NC State. You won two national championships. No, nobody. The, the story of the '83 team just it, it it's why we love this damn tournament. You know, exactly. I, I saw they 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 put up on the screen when y'all were in the ACC tournament. You had 17 wins going into the 1983 ACC tournament. You had 17 wins going into the 2024 ACC tournament, and you're on a roll. And this guy Burns, I mean, he's cool as hell. And, and, and you know, wait, wait, hold on. The Simpsons, Mr. Burns, he's the businessman. This guy is a, he's just cool. He's a big guy. And people look at him and like, he's really athletic. What, yeah. by the way, did he play a little football? I know, you remember Jordan Davis, the great defensive lineman for Georgia a couple of years ago, you know, who came out of high school as a two or a three star at six foot seven defensive lineman, first round draft pick, I think plays for the Eagles. He was a great basketball player at Charlotte. Anybody that comes out of North Carolina with blood in their veins probably played a little basketball. Well, especially if you're six eight or you know, and yeah, three hundred yeah. pounds, like that's right. Burns is, I mean, there's some coaches three hundred now. Come on, you sound like Charles Barkley. Remember they used to say Kevin in college he was six seven two seventy. We were all there going, he's three fifty, and, he's and he six was not four. six seven. He was six yeah. three and three quarters. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, and, 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 you know, we forget the guy that went to South Alabama, one of their greatest players of all time, Ricky the Blimp Sinclair out of Macon Southwest, six foot eight, 370, and had dancing feet. I love it. You know, uh, goodness, uh, you know, this tournament just, you're, you know, it does bring out so much. You know, God, I mean. I love it. It, it it the you you watch in the stands you know I, and I'm going to go back to that Houston game last night watching the fans from both teams literally yeah. living and you know watching Houston fans saying oh no not again because you talk about a team that's been to Final Fours I think they've been to like five or six Final Fours they've never won one. They're going to be the Florida State of, of college basketball. You know, Florida State has been to the College World Series, uh, I think, 68 times, and they're 0 for 68, something like that. You know, they, yeah. they, but Houston fans, you could tell, they're looking, they're saying, oh, God, you know, don't take this away from us. This may, We may win it this year. And, yeah. Well, look, and I'm with you. And, and by the way, uh, we had a cool deal. We had a wild game cookout with Bud Ritchie at the Sigma New House over at Rhodes College over the weekend. Cooked. I went by my processor and picked up all kind of deer stew and venison boudin, venison Italian sausage, brats. Great, great, great time. I got to say something about that commander over there, Porter Kaufman out of Chattanooga. And these kids love college basketball. And these kids, by the way, you're worried about the future of America. You ain't met many. You're not getting around enough, you know. Great, great group of kids. But Tommy, uh, by the way, Shoney, Tommy went to Walmart this weekend. No, he's not a bandwagoner, dude. <laughs> he's, he's from Wilmington, North Carolina, the walk-on. Who loves you, baby? <laughs> they, they, by the way, Tommy, <laughs> that, friends, you, I mean, you can't get any better than these, these stories that y'all are telling. So, Tommy... Think about how much Wolfpack paraphernalia is flying off the shelves right now from the bookstores. And, 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 and again, Kevin, he just mentioned it. You've got Auburn, Alabama, and Georgia all within 15, 20 minutes of each other. I mean, Ric Flair, someone said on here, Ric Flair needs a spot. I mean, good God. You've got those three yeah. schools. And, and Tommy, the University of New Jersey at Durham. That's what a lot of people call Duke. Yeah. I mean, Duke is definitely a transplant school. I mean, I, you know, all my buddies that when I was growing up in North Carolina and, and, you know, you're applying to school, I don't think anybody from my high school, and not that they couldn't go to Duke, I don't think anybody went to Duke. You know, it was just a, um, it's a, you go there and you, I got the chance when I was doing my ACC road trip show 
to be an actual Cameron crazy for a day. We camped out overnight. Funny. This is a great, this is a great story. <clears throat> so we go and we're like, okay, we're going to go literally camp out overnight with the Cameron crazies. And they were playing Maryland the next day. And Maryland was, a, they, I think both teams at the time were in the top five in the country. And, uh, and so we're going to camp out overnight with the Cameron crazies, wake up the next morning, get in line, go through and be in the, you know, be in the, um, and uh, and Cameron, you know, two hours before the game, get the get the the cheer, you know, list everything. We we're going to do it all. Well, we get there that night, and believe it or not, it's freezing, freaking cold. And all of a sudden, it starts dumping snow like it's seven thirty, eight o'clock at night. Oh, I mean, dumping snow. So I look at so. I, you know, we're hanging out in the tents with the crazies and we're playing like Monopoly, doing whatever, having a good time, goofing off on everything's being filmed for the show. And I look at my producer and my, my camera guy and I was like, hey, shoot this real quick. He's like, all right. So I climb in the, in the sleeping bag and I'm like, all right, good night, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Cameron Crazies, Duke, Maryland, let's do it. And, you know, and I tell him, say, cut. So we cut. And I look at my producer. I'm like, come on, we're going to the Marriott. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and we just we jump in the car, go to the Marriott, stay all night because it's snowed four inches of snow. And, and there you go. Today. So we go back in the morning. I climb back in the in the in the same sleeping bag and pretend like I'm just waking up. And it's seen, it cut together perfectly as a TV show. But um, but yeah, Duke. I mean, Duke is definitely a transplant school. But it, they look, their fans are passionate. You got to love it, yeah. especially with their, when it comes yeah. to basketball. I mean, there's no other experience like it. If you haven't been there, it really is a a kind of just an amazing spectacle is a good way to put it. it. But, it um, is. but, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the ACC is riding high right now. And I'll tell you an interesting fact. I was just thinking about this today. NC State's playing Marquette, who we beat in 74 to win the national championship. The other bracket, wow. if Houston beats Duke, then we play Houston and we, who we beat in 83 championship. So the irony of wow. having both those teams in the same bracket and could, we could play them both if we continue to dance is pretty ironic to me so yeah uh there are no conspiracies and there are no coincidences this is cool kevin skarbinski let me say this franz beard gatorbatmedia.com check him out on the buddy martin show monday through thursday nights 9 p.m eastern live on youtube it's all over uh kevin uh the birmingham lead scarbo knows uh pack productions tommy does a lot of production work does some acting uh Kevin, kind of close us out. Let me say we live in the greatest country in the history of the world, folks. We're blessed beyond belief. Thanks to all of our sponsors, our viewers, and everybody. Check them all out on our website with the hyperlinks. We're blessed to have you. But, Kevin, check us out of here, and we'll, we'll say goodbye and be back tomorrow. But love this energy. Thank you all for coming on here. We really appreciate it. We'll Mr. say Wolf. goodbye with one last uh, shout-out to Samford. I go to my website. This is a, a bonus free column at Kevin Scar or Kevin Skarbinski.com. I was so moved by the epic nature of that game that I wrote, I didn't write a column about it. I wrote a song about it. And when oh you read it, when you read it, you have to, you have to hear the record Love of the Edmund Fitzgerald in your head because that's the way I wrote it. It's wow. called the wreck of the Bucky McMillan. Check it out. Kevin Skarbinski.com. That's hey, what look. the tournament's about. Kind of like when, is this, so, so it isn't like the one that that Alex Karras wrote about Iowa. Go Iowa, go, go Iowa, go, go Iowa, go Iowa, go. Hey, go. Let, let me say this: during the week, do yourselves a favor. Watch Survive in advance, and listen. I mean, if, if you don't love Jim Valvano, I question if you love your grandparents and your family. Uh, in your country, because what he did as an underdog, you know, he said, do three things every day of your life, laugh, cry, and think. If you do that and listen to that speech, if you ever get down, you ever have any doubts about this country or the people around you or what you do or how things are going in your life, watch Survive in advance. Uh, Tommy, Franz, Kevin, and Mitch was on here earlier. Brendan Martin, our executive producer. Uh, what a blast, man. I mean, they couldn't get Led Zeppelin together for $800 million, but we got this crew together for uh, coffee and uh, Bailey's Irish whiskey in the morning. But, Mr. Wolf, I, I want I, – I, I just – the irony, Houston and NC State, a lot of stories to talk about. But, anyway, awesome. Let's do it again next Monday, guys. Lots of basketball left. We'll see you then. Thank you. See you We're guys. out of here, everybody. Take care.
In a perfect world, you'd set a health goal and results would happen overnight. In this world, the real world, it takes time, dedication, and the right support to achieve your best self. The Vitamin Shops health enthusiasts are here to make sure you're not wasting a single moment on the wrong supplements. From the highest quality sports nutrition and superfoods to the most sought after trends, you'll find a huge variety of science-backed solutions for every goal and the people to help guide you along the path to greatness. Unbelievably, every two minutes in our communities, a child is either bought or sold for sex. I'm Ari Vicky, board member for the Nashville Anti-Human Trafficking Coalition. Join me and millions of others in our fight against human trafficking and for its victims by helping to educate the most vulnerable among us, our middle and high school students. Go to nhtcoalition.org, become a partner, and help keep our families safe, because none of God's children are for sale.